Tonight, we must begin with the first story. The myth written before all myths. The myth that we have the oldest record of. The story of Gilgamesh. So when I say Gilga, you say Mesh. Gilga? G no, well, okay, we'll work on that. At the dawning of civilization, there was a great king in the ancient city of Uruk in the land of Sumer, which will later be known as Babylon. He was so mighty, none could stand before him, for he was two-thirds god and one-third man. I don't quite know how the math plays out there, but that's beside the point. His name was Gilgamesh, and wherever he went, he slew his enemies and cast them down before him. But his might made him a tyrant. Bored, he would force the young men of Uruk into contests of endurance until they dropped from exhaustion. And of the women, he claimed their marriage bed. No daughter of Uruk was safe from his lust. So the people of Uruk cried out to the gods, and the gods heard them and conferred on what to do. At last, they decided to fashion a being to match Gilgamesh in strength so the two of them might exist as equals and exhaust Gilgamesh's boundless energy. And so, they fashioned a wild man out of water and clay. They placed him in the wilderness and named him Enkidu. His body was matted with hair like an animal's, and the hair on his head grew thick like barley and was long as could be. He ate grass with the beasts of the wild and cavorted with the gazelles at the watering hole. Like this, he was happy. But then one day, a trapper came to the watering hole and saw Enkidu dancing with the beasts and was afraid, because he could see the savage strength in Enkidu. And so he came back again and again to observe him and finally realized this was the man who had been troubling him. Because for some time now, the trapper had been presented with a mystery. He would dig pits to catch the animals, and they would get filled in. He would lay snares for the beasts, and they would get taken apart, so he could not catch any game. Now, though, he knew that it was Enkidu saving the animals. The trapper went to his father to ask for advice, and his father told him to get the priestess Shamat to seduce this wild man. So the trapper traveled to Uruk to ask Gilgamesh for the priestess's aid. Gilgamesh agreed, and Shamat accompanied the trapper back to Enkidu's watering hole. When Enkidu saw Shamat, he was smitten with her charms, and for six days and seven nights, they made love. At last, Enkidu turned back to his herd, but they rejected him, for he had traded the ways of the wild for the ways of humankind. And so, he returned to Shamat, and she spoke kindly to him, and offered to take him back to Uruk, where he could be with other people. But on the way, Shamat took him to a shepherd's camp, and there set before him bread and ale. But Enkidu knew not how to eat bread or drink from a cup, and so at the camp they taught him of the human things. And their barber combed his hair, put oils in it, and he for the first time wore clothes and took up arms. And he took over the watch for the shepherds, fighting off wolves and lions that came too near. Then one day he was invited to a wedding, and he asked what such a thing was. And as the shepherds explained to him, they also told him of Gilgamesh and how it was his custom to sleep with the bride before the husband. Enkidu was appalled by this, so he strode off to Uruk to change this custom his way. Meanwhile, Gilgamesh walked down the streets of Uruk, but when he got to the door of the marriage house, he found that someone had the impudence to stick their foot out and block his way. Looking up, he saw Enkidu standing before him. Without a word, they lunged at each other. They wrestled in the street, their titanic frames making the houses shake as they threw one another into walls and pummeled each other into buildings. After a long battle, exhausted, they each rolled aside and lay panting in the street. But Gilgamesh recovered first and offered his hand to Enkidu to help him up. His anger had cooled. He was impressed by Enkidu's strength, and as Enkidu stood, Gilgamesh offered him not just his hand, but his friendship. They swore friendship to one another, which reads to me that the power of friendship is actually enough to stop a brutal dictator. Thanks, mythology. Soon, Gilgamesh proposed to his friend an adventure he'd long had in mind. The fierce giant Humbaba, whose words are fire and whose breath is death, 
stalks the forest of cedars where the gods dwell. So to his newfound friend, Gilgamesh said, <clears throat> Dude, to immortalize our names and make them known wherever people linger, we should totally slay this demon. <laughs> but Enkidu had known Humbaba from his days in the wild and said, Why would you want to do such a thing? He can hear for like 60 leagues and his voice is like the deluge. When warriors want to refer to an unwinnable battle, they call it a Humbaba's ambush, man. But Gilgamesh was not swayed. He replied, Like all things mortal, our days are numbered. So, let us write our epic upon the sky. <laughs> and with that, he grabbed his new friend's hand and dragged him into the forge, where together they cast great axes of war and daggers sharp and swift. At last, Gilgamesh gathered the people of Uruk and proposed to them what he was to do. And the wisest of them cried out and implored him not to go. Because remember, he's totally a good dude now and everybody loves him because of friendship. Humbaba, they said, was the guardian of the woods of the gods and second only in strength to the gods that dwelled there. These cries, though, would not deter Gilgamesh, for he had a demon to kill, bro. Bro.